the Tri-County Parish. We're four United Methodist churches in three counties with two pastors and one heart for Christ. We're part of the Williamsport District of the Susquehanna Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lar, and very glad you could worship with us on this Holy Thursday, Maundy Thursday. With me today, I'm very glad to welcome Mr. Ken Robertson from Canton Ecumenical Parish and Mrs. Dana Vermilia from the Ward United Methodist Church joining us. I invite you, if you have a bulletin, to join us in the call to worship. Otherwise, sit still and just let the Spirit of God wash over you. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Let us pray. Gracious God, your anointed one, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. Mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life. Amen. The first reading today comes from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water. But roasted over the fire with its hind, excuse me, its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on, your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The second reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during the supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Our third reading also comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, beginning with verse 21. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And when asked who, Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread 
when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to Judas, do quickly what you are going to do. No one at the table knew why Jesus said this to Judas. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. This, to, this evening, we'll be sharing with you a story written by Herbert Bronstein. It's called A Night Different from All Other Nights. Will you pray with me? Lord God, on this evening, as we recall the Last Supper of Jesus, that last meal that Christ spent with his friends before he was betrayed and arrested, we invite you to reveal to us new teachings and learnings and draw us closer to you so that we might have a better appreciation of the sacrifice Jesus made for us. In your name we pray. Amen. It was the eve of the Passover, and Roman occupied Jerusalem. Jesus had been proclaiming the reign of God, teaching and healing in Galilee and Berea. Recently, he made his way to Jerusalem to observe the festival there with his friends and followers, as all faithful Jews longed to do. Jesus' ministry attracted a small but noticeable following and it evoked serious opposition from Romans and Jews alike who were charged with keeping the public order in the capital city. One person in the latter group was Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, or Council of Jewish Leaders. Some people thought he was also one of Jesus' followers. The attention that focused on Jesus weighed heavily on Joseph, because it underlined his own struggle to know what faithfulness required of him. Was that carpenter from Galilee perverting the nation and urging sedition? Or did he speak with the very voice of God? Joseph's pastoral responsibilities for the safety and welfare of the people and his theological responsibility to discern the significance of Jesus' identity and ministry, both hung in the balance of that judgment. The cloud of impending crisis that hung over the city of Jerusalem made Joseph think that soon he would have to answer that question in the company of the council and before God's very self. Joseph's household is in the midst of last-minute preparations 
to keep the Passover feast. The special dishes are ready and the aromas of the dinner fill the house. You can almost smell the scent of the freedom that will be remembered and prayed for as the cups are passed and the rich and bittersweet foods are consumed. Joseph's wife, Rebecca, watches her husband pace from the window to the door and back again, gazing toward the Temple Mount and fingering the fringes of his prayer shawl. Joseph, what's wrong? The family is beginning to gather and your eyes stare into the distance. This is a night different from all other nights because we, re we remember God's wonderful deeds for our ancestors when we were slaves in Egypt and ever since. But there is no joy on your face tonight. You're right, I'm afraid. Everything and everyone in this city is on edge. The crowds who have come for the festival are bigger than ever, but there's an ugly undertone. It's as though the people are expecting trouble and are going to do their best to make sure we'll have it. The Roman garrison is on alert, and for any hint of unrest, and frankly, nervous Romans terrify me. They have our own high priest in a panic, too. The responsibility for the city's welfare rests on his shoulders, and he keeps trying to run ahead of the rumors to be sure that nothing goes wrong. What kind of trouble do they expect? I think the high priest is right. Take preventive action. Don't give the Romans any excuses to make other people's lives any harder than they already are. Well, in principle, I agree with you, but it's not that easy. You see, there has been an escalation of troubles lately. You know, a soldier is knifed here, tax payments don't arrive. The people are tired of Rome, and they're impatient. They want their land back for us Jews. They don't want to pay their hard-earned shekels to support the luxuries our occupiers seem to think are their necessities. I have to agree with the people on that. Remember how the prophets have called the wealthy back to the responsibility for the poor in the land. And here we, who are charged with keeping that tradition, sit and do nothing while the poor are bled to death in front of our faces. But Joseph, what can you do? You can't save the world, you know. You're a good leader. You care for the people. You have helped us survive during these hard years. I know, saving the world is God's work. But here, you know, God has no hands but ours. And all I seem to be able to do is wring my hands. You see, I want what's best for our family. I want us to have food on our table. Food for us, for all our servants, and for those to whom we give charity be far beyond the requirements of the law. And I want what's best for our people, all of our people. And best is not for the Romans to be anxious and take out their anxiety in renewed repressions against everyone. So, name names then. If you know where the trouble is being instigated, is that so hard? That's just the problem. Everybody knows who's under scrutiny. There's this carpenter from Nazareth who seems to be the current focus of Rome's anxiety. He keeps talking about God as the ruler of all that is, with a vision of a reign of justice and peace for all God's children. He gives voice to my faith and my longing, I tell you. It's so unlike what we have right now. He teaches with the most wonderful stories, always catches you up short, and makes you see how business as usual undermines God's will. He's a healer, too. He reaches out to the poorest of the poor, demanding no money, no qualifications in order to receive his help, only that they receive it. And he talks about the need to love people without limits, love that has hands and feet and shekels to back it up. I can see why the Romans are scared of him. If people start taking this Jesus too seriously, Rome's days will be numbered. The Roman authorities and our own priests are smart enough to recognize that. I hear rumors that some have decided that one way or another, we have to get rid of him. But I think you are agreeing with him, Joseph. You scare me. I do agree with him somewhat. Uh, he isn't as careful as I would like about following our law. So sometimes I wonder, even though what he says sounds like Jeremiah or Amos or Micah, or like the wonderful Sabbath vision of the Torah itself, could he really be bringing a word from the Lord 
and still be so out of step with our holiest people? Besides, whether I agree with it or not, I have a responsibility to all the people. I'm a shepherd of the flock. They count on me to keep things at least survivable, to protect him from the worst imaginations on those who act in behalf of Rome. What if this man is just a rabble-rouser with a gift for playing our heartstrings? What if supporting him means many are killed and our holy temple is destroyed? How then will we honor God? Who will be left to tell the stories of God's will and God's ways to our children? Can't we just keep the feast tonight, Joseph? Remind our children once again of this, our most beautiful story? It has always been enough to make our hearts strong, no matter how hard the path. Can't you resolve this after Passover, when the crowds are gone and everyone can think clearly about what to do? I don't know, my dear wife. I heard rumors today in the city. I'm afraid things will come to a head sooner rather than later. The members of the household arrive at the feast. They eat and tell stories and sing songs and pray throughout the evening. Rebecca keeps glancing at Joseph, watching the lines on his face deepen and his soldier shoulders sag, despite his obvious effort to carry the joy-filled melodies of the festival. The Passover meal ends with this blessing. This privilege we share will never be renewed until God's plan is known in full. God's highest blessing seal. Peace, peace for us, for everyone, for all people, this our hope. Soon the lamps have been extinguished and Rebecca and Joseph are settling down to sleep. In the distance, they hear a rooster crow. Joseph says, That bird again. I've heard it several times tonight. I tell you, even the animals and the trees and the stars in the heavens are out of sorts this night. There's a loud knock on the door. Joseph pulls on a robe and steps outside. A minute later, he comes back to his wife's side. It's just as I had feared. They've arrested Jesus. The council has been summoned. The Romans want us to decide his fate. As the Holy One is my witness, I don't know what we should do. Should we back this prophet and put our city at risk? Or should we be safe and silence him for the sake of all the people? And what does safety mean if his voice really is the voice of God? As we know now, looking back and reflecting, Jesus' voice was the voice of God, and on this day we remember how he instituted the Last Supper, taking a piece of bread, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you, and in a cup after supper, filled with wine, and saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember the sacrifice that comes from the love of a Savior this day. May it bring you hope in these troubled times, knowing that God loves us. Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord God, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, for the way in which he gave himself up, that we might have life everlasting. During these troubled times, Lord, Focus our hearts and our minds on your Savior, Jesus the Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for worship this Monday Thursday, and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow on Good Friday as we continue and remember the crucifixion of Jesus. Remember, spread the word, not the germs. God bless.